take the uh, Mrs. Gandhi's reign. A lot of uh, her behavior patterns would seem somewhat similar to Mr. Modi today. Some of the things that Indira Gandhi was criticized for as press censorship, you know, self-aggrandizement, the pattern is repeated. And also uh, one party, Even parties are not democratically run in Indira Gandhi, never believed. She was the lone woman who decided. She was, they, as they used to say, the only man in a cabinet of women. Mm. And in the case of Mr. Modi's cabinet, I think when he speaks, nobody interrupts or has anything much to say. Huh? I can't say for sure because history has not shown that it's easy for them to get together. And the reason has always been that the difficulty in selecting one leader. One leader. Okay. And I think that the biggest mistake they will make if Rahul Gandhi is made that one leader. It will be the greatest advantage for Mr. Modi. Today's guest is one of the most respected journalists in India. She's one of the longest serving journalists. She's worked in the Indian Express for over 50 years and 50 years as a journalist seeing all these truths about modern India's history unfold, researching so much has led to her perspectives that she holds today. Today's conversation was both slightly historical and slightly political. If you're someone who enjoys political commentary, political conversations, you're going to enjoy this episode. And you know what? I used to be a person who didn't enjoy political conversations till not too long ago. Until I realized that if it's spoken in the right kind of tonality in a friendly language with jokes placed in the middle, political conversations can also be super fun and super endearing, but most importantly, super educative. Please watch this episode till the end, especially if you don't enjoy political conversations, because maybe this particular one will change your mind because we're talking to the endearing Kumi Kapoor. Kumi Kapoor, welcome to the Ranveer Show. Thank you for calling me. I hope I fit into this very mod hep show. Uh, I'm a bit of a dinosaur for it, I think. I think considering you fit. my age. No, you fit straight in. Trust me on that. Okay, it's all, let's hope so. It's all about vibe. It's all about the energy. I'm honestly loving already having spoken to you. Like, I feel like you have a lot to share. I love that you've seen the story of India unfold. Has that been the privilege of your life as a journalist? Well, story, I don't know. But I've been in journalism for 50 years, which is a pretty long time. So I've seen many regimes come and go. Okay. Uh, started with Indira Gandhi when she was at her height. And now I'm with the, Mr. Modi when he's at his height. What was your personal favorite phase of journalism? Well, you know, for most of us journalists in Delhi who are political animals... The best phases are, or are where you get the most inside information are always those governments which are weak. Because the stronger the person in power, the prime minister, is the natural rule. The less information flows, the more people are scared, the more pressures there are on the media and the owners. Okay. So when the uh, governments were weak, it may not have been good for the country economically, but in terms of freedom of the press, it was a thumbs up. Okay. Which was the weakest government that you've ever seen? Well, I think the weakest governments were at that period when we had three in a row. First, we had, um, you, know, you know, Mr... Uh, who was there? There was the Deva Gowda, then there was Indra Gujral. They were looking desperately for a prime minister. The Congress basically wanted to throw out hmm. anyone and call for an election. They've done that twice. They did it when Mr. Chandrasekhar was there also. Hmm. And at that time, the press, in fact, realizing the governments are so weak, can become bullies. I remember when the few days that Mr. Deva Gowda was prime minister, I mean, the press took all these photos of him coming back from some trip abroad. And I mean, his kids or his grandkids were carrying a few toys as if this was some big, big thing when, you know, we've seen people in politics who've made 
cross. So mm. that was such a small thing. But that's what I mean that the press also takes advantage yeah. of people when they're not very strong. Okay. But how does this lead to a leak of information? It's a chain of all the way down. The uh, people who are in the, the bureaucracy, they become emboldened because they know who's going to be, they don't know who's going to be boss tomorrow. So they're willing to give information, tell stories. In exchange for money? No, no, no. There's no question of money. I mean, they're willing to talk more. But okay. when it's a strong government, we saw in Dira Gandhi during the emergency, Mr. Modi's government is another. It may not be a total repeat performance in the sense that there's no formal censorship as such. But yes, things have tightened a lot. You can mm. make that out very clearly in mm. the media. Mm. We had a you can see it in the television channels also. What do and you the mean? The ownership patterns. Okay, you want to expand on that thought? Well, you've seen recent takeover by our uh, latest multimillionaire of uh, the NDTV. You're allowed to say it. it's a podcast. It's new age media. And I knew about NDTV. Okay. So, it looked a little as if the last, one of the last people standing anti-government. I don't say whether they're right or wrong, but a g freedom of demo uh, expression and democracy in a country of uh, means that they should be across the board. Mm. you know different viewpoints mm. they are because of social media you can't block it out any yeah. longer it will always be there but I mean the major media there's a certain amount of pressure on them mm. you don't find it I don't find that uh, it's equalized is that what no, you're asking no I'm saying you don't find for example that newspapers televisions they're more circumspect in reporting news careful a lot I'm going to be very like straightforward to the point where I might even offend you with what I'm saying yeah but uh, I'm a part of the generation which has entirely grown up with social media huh. my access to current affairs has been through social media always huh, that's a good thing because since you're using social media you know no government can really shut up yeah. social media okay now I have to go for a pre-planned question with you okay sure. so you've been with the Indian Express for very 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 long yeah, I have been for the Express for very long, but I've been in a lot of other newspapers as well in between. Okay. Huh. okay. There was a movie called Guru. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it's loosely based on Dhruva Ambani. And there's yeah. a character played by Mithun Chakravarti in that movie. Yeah. Uh, it represents Mr. Goenka, I believe. Who yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be because Mr. Goenka was very much involved in the fight with uh, uh, Mr. Dhirubhai Ambani. Okay. Back in Rajiv Gandhi's uh, time as Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, uh, could you draw a picture of that time when Dhirubhai Ammani was rising up the ranks? I want to know what my country was like in the 60s and 70s because my only context this, is movies like Guru. Uh, actually, that was in the early 80s. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dhirubhai Ammani started rising in the 70s uh, with Indira Gandhi helping him but it came to a head in the early 80s when um, no probably it came to a head because uh, uh, there was this uh, Dhirubhai Ambani was uh, all the other industrialists dealing in the textile business because he started in the textile business um, they were uh, keen to, uh, saw that all the laws being framed in Delhi were helping him and against them and one of them a lot of big textile firms in fact closed down at that time and this gentleman who was considered an upstart then we saw his rise and rise and rise wow one man took him on that was a scare it's in my second book in fact um nasli wadia who felt he was being unfairly treated because he had an old family textile firm but uh, it was Dhirubhai and Bani, uh, you know, whatever he used that was being given the go ahead rather than the yarn that he wanted to use. Right. Then he started uh, cooperating with Mr. Going, uh, Going Car, and they brought a whole lot of investigative stories against Mr. Ambani. Okay. But it became far more complicated than that because. Then when Rajiv Gandhi was there, Rajiv Gandhi came, became, was convinced 
by somebody or the other, presumably by Mr. Ambani's men, that actually they're targeting you. So you better do something to keep them in check. Then there were raids on Indian Express. Mr. Wadia was um, stopped from coming to the country because they said he was a dual passport. And Indian Express also started investigating um, uh, corruption cases against the go then government. And they found a very con uh, good one in Bofors, which mm. came out at that time. So it was all interconnected. Too confusing for your young readers to <laughs> recall. No? It's great. Uh, I think we're getting context from people like yourself. Uh, recently, we had this podcast where we did the history of post-independence India up to the Kargil War. Huh. Um, one chapter that I found extremely fascinating was Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, and the gentleman we had on the show, Gokhale sir, he basically said that Rajiv Gandhi started off his political career in a very brash way, had people who were advising him, maybe in some wrong ways, but eventually uh, he started becoming mature and he was starting to take strong decisions and that's about the time the assassination happened and people were hopeful about what he would do for the country uh, going forward into the 90s. Do you look at it differently? Uh, since I was quite at the forefront of there and observing what happened. It wasn't quite like that. Okay. He, uh, he had his advisors and he listened to them a lot. Uh, but I think that he was constrained because he had the right ideas. He did want to bring about liberalization, but he was obviously uh, his uh, Arun Nehru, for example, who was one of his advisors for a long time, tried to hold him back so that uh, Rajiv's tragedy was that he couldn't do what he really wanted. Why was he held back though? That's true. Why was he? Because he was advised not to go too fast, too quickly. But here after him followed a very weak prime minister in the sense that he didn't really have support, uh, Narsimha Rao. But he was able to liberalize. Mm. Mm. You want to draw out a picture of uh, the Rajiv Gandhi story? I'll, I'll tell you why. Yeah. Honestly, Rahul Gandhi today has a lot of bad publicity mm -hmm. and people associate Rajiv Gandhi now purely with Rahul Gandhi and by people, I mean the youth. So why don't you draw out a picture of Rajiv Gandhi's mind times story right from the start? He, he was actually a nice guy. And unlike his younger brother, Sanjay, who was supposed to have become the political one in the family and take over from the mother, he kept to his air. Uh, as a pilot, he remained as a pilot as long as Sanjay was on the scene. It was only later that he came to the forefront after his mother died and he was immediately made uh, prime minister with the biggest majority ever. Uh, but for with a man with that kind of a majority, he didn't do what was expected of him. Which was what? Which was liberalization was one of the main things. There were others. He realized, for example, there's a lot of mismanagement. He famously made that statement that I think 60 to 70 percent of all the money that we give in welfare projects gets eaten up and not doesn't pass down to the people it's meant for. So he should have tried to plug that mm. instead of just stating it. Okay. He was quite naive in that way okay. and honest. Huh? Rich boy syndrome. No, I think he wasn't really connected that much with p politics, though he came from such a political family. He kept his distance in a way. I don't think his wife, Sonia, at that stage was interested in him joining politics. Okay. So he was a reluctant politician. I think possibly he was the only one who was originally, of the Gandhis, who was originally slightly reluctant. Okay. The rest were never. Coming back to this story. Yeah. How do you remember the 90s then? the liberalization of the economy because that's where my biological memories started forming and yeah, those are my earliest memories in life of going to one of the country's first McDonald's, one of the country's first Domino's. That's how I processed it and there was so it, many... It, it was an absolute sea change. Sure, if I was to describe to you what when I first came to Delhi to work, I was, I'm a Bombay girl, I came to Delhi to work. When we first came, it was like being in a semi-Soviet country. We couldn't get gas for months, you know, there were ra uh, because there were rations. We, we, we couldn't get cars. You had to wait in a waiting list if to get them. You couldn't even get a watch, your HMT watch, because it, there were only a few government 
uh, regulated uh, manufacturing units. It wasn't given out to the private sector at all. And so that socialism pattern that was there held us back for decades. I mean, people were always, it was so pathetic that anyone going abroad was expected to come back with a suitcase full mm. of stuff to hand out to all relatives and friends because we couldn't get the stuff in India. You're like a very soft North Korea, a very soft version of North Korea. Fair to say? No, um, not uh, soft. Uh, yeah. It was <laughs> like a semi, so, uh, you know, one. Uh, sure. So, Okay. Socialist country. Okay. Hmm. And how do you compare that with times now where the country is aggressive about entrepreneurship, capitalism? How do you feel about the current government as well? So do you no, that's such a very general question. How do I feel? You, you can answer generally and then we'll dive straight into the specifics. Oh, well, one would agree with some of their policies and not agree with others. Okay. They say that they are for free enterprise, but they have their favorites as is very clear. Okay. And they put strictures on some and not on others. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Uh, you're talking about. About the government's attitude towards industry. They have their favorites. Okay. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Which is the Ambani's and the Adani's? Well, I would say the latter is certainly a favorite. Mm. Uh, okay. He's grown so fast. Uh, okay. Okay. So that, I mean, uh, people have been commenting on that fact. Uh, Who do you think they don't favor? I would assume that the people who got uh, lost out on contracts to Ms. Adani, for example, GMR, which used to handle the airport, I think, in Bombay. Mm. Mm. Is Mr. Adani handling it now? Yeah. yeah. And, and handling many other and airports. And there are others who are considered, uh, industrialists considered close to the earlier regime. Not now. It happens in all regimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like whoever you're close to. Yeah. I mean, why do industrialists uh, fund politicians? They fund it in the hope that eventually they'll get some favors when they come to power. Hmm. Okay. And that happens in all cases. It happens in a lot of cases, yes. But most industrialists spread their bet, hedge their bets, and um, what do you call it? Uh, fund the party in power or the one they think is coming to power. Now, it's generally believed. I don't know if it's true or not. For example, this reason that they introduced this easing out of the 2,000 rupee notes. Why do you think that happened? You tell me. What is your view of that? A big, two reasons. One, yeah. probably the common man doesn't really use 2,000 rupee notes. Oh, that's a very simplistic I mean, explanation. The, the second reason I have is like, I mean... I would like to believe it's another cleanup of uh, Kala Dhan. Like but did black the money. first uh, demonetization uh, clean up Kala Dhan? I don't think so. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the data. You tell me. No, I just looking around you, we got back almost all the money uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, was to be demonetized. But uh, uh, a lot of us lost money. Even I found, discovered uh, notes much later, which were invalid. So I think they know, uh, what happened was a lot of counterfeit money also got regularized in the process. But I would suspect that in the present case, when the 2000 suddenly they decide to inconvenience everyone by... Uh, taking it, easing out the 2000 rupee note, it would be a step uh, against the opposition since people, uh, the industrialists don't like to fund through bonds, electoral bonds, as you probably know about 90% goes to the ruling party. Mm. So they would like to fund other parties, but how do you do it? It has to be the good old cash mm. and easiest note is the 2000 rupee note. Okay. I mean, that is the general conjecture that the person who was the most penalized by this 2000 rupee note uh, being eased out were the opposition political parties. Yeah. Because they had a lot of it. From the industrialists? From the industrialists and others. For the sake funders. of funding yeah. their political the campaigns for 2020. didn't want to do it openly. Okay. So it's to make uh, their political campaign. This is campaign. my conjecture. Maybe wrong. Okay. No, cool. I mean, I'll tell you what, you have the right to have this kind of a conjecture because of your career. Spend researching. So if anyone should have a conjecture, it should be no, you. No, I said not spend researching. It's just, I mean, it's my surmise. Based on pattern recognition, which I'm sure you've seen in the past. Yeah. 
do patterns actually repeat themselves over the course of 50 years have you seen too yeah, many yeah 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 history as they say repeats itself the first time it's tragedy the second time is farce okay what what's the logic of cabinet uh, reshuffles like i didn't understand this aspect of it well this time there was not a big cabinet reshuffle there was just a very mini the law minister was given a very minor post so obviously he did something that was not liked by the powers that be uh, i'm generally also asking you huh? that why do cabinet reshuffles happen why don't they let one person stay in a ministry long enough and do that thing is it based totally on performance or is it like if one person performs in one of the ministries really well they shift it to like another it i've never seen any logic very often in cabinet reshuffles Random. and th- sometimes they are f- uh, in preparation for an election when particular castes have to be given importance and things like that as well like what does that mean that means if a person is from a particular uh, you know region or a community or who votes are required in a forthcoming election that person may be elevated for that reason as well elevated huh. you mean to say that different ministries are at different I levels mean, of importance i mean it's it's not that a cabinet let's put it i would put it that i wouldn't say that cabinet formation is based on the person who's best for the job that's obvious okay it's more on political reasons okay you don't agree i didn't feel that when i went to uh, the cabinet yeah. i uh, my my favorite podcast amongst all of them was with rajiv chandrashekar yeah who has been the founder of bpl yes and he now- was he is very well suited for his ministry i agree okay, okay. okay. so uh, he's one exception do you yeah. feel any of them are not good for their particular ministries uh, let's not get into names now but i mean a lot of them are there for because they represent powerful political groups and their representation is required in the cabinet that's how all indian ca- uh, cabinets are formed you, i mean of all the uh, mps you certainly don't pick the one who is most suited for a particular post right as in as in say i mean there must be so many very uh, you know qualified people in a particular but they're not pulled out because they may have no clout at all okay and, okay So you're saying that the cabinet is always a representation of different parts I mean, of uh, India. Political interests are as important, and frankly, the weight of the prime minister and a few of his senior ministers carries down the line, so that the actual ministers may not have that much control over their ministries. You're saying there's a bit of favoritism mixed with political agenda. Uh, political agenda. Not what? What is fa- political agenda? Favorite. political agenda is you want one state to get a certain representation ah. for example okay or past promises that have to come through now true ha ah. okay mm. like do you think uh, when uh, mrs india left the congress and uh, that whole thing happened in mp where he wasn't uh, basically allowed to come to power in mp completely then he went to the bjp and instead of them uh empowering him in mp they said no no why don't you come and join the cabinet do you think that was that's a case of like political agenda no and- i don't think mr sindhya was interested in uh, i think he w- was happy to be in the center rather than in the state okay uh, because already there was a chief minister who was long running in the state so the rumors are that there was a big uh, game of thrones y situation in mp i think no i don't think that sindhya was ever really in the running for the chief minister's post and i think temperamentally he was also more suited for a uh, p- post at the center which uh, and i think he likes what he's got also civil aviation yeah. why do you think he left the congress because they weren't uh, giving him empowering him for years okay sidelining him because there's so many factions of the congress in madhya pradesh that he was you know sidelined his people when there was an election to be held were not given tickets and things like that so he felt humiliated okay tell me about the most difficult phase of your whole journalism career mm i suppose in some ways the most difficult phase was during the emergency when indira gandhi had imposed an emergency and done away with f- our fundamental rights any ca- anyone could be lifted uh, put into jail if the government wanted at that time and there was no recourse to the courts to get bail or release so it affected me also personally because my brother in law happened to be in politics was was wanted to, uh, there was a 
arrest warrant against him. My husband was put into jail because really? he got into a fight with a Congress politician because she wanted to arrest some young boys who were shouting slogans, long live democracy. So he was put into jail. My newspaper was under attack in the last days of the emergency. It was almost closed down, the Indian Express. So it was a difficult period, but it was a challenging period also. What One was could show on metal. Huh? What was specifically challenging about it? That whether you could rise to the occasion to do what little you could as a citizen at times of this. For example, when Indira Gandhi announced that she was holding elections in 1977, much before all your audience <laughs> would remember. But, you know, censorship was still there, so you shouldn't write. But I'm very proud of the Indian Express newspaper because it went ahead and we all wrote of what had happened in those 19 months. But most newspapers didn't. They mm. just kept, kept silent. So that is, you know, the challenge of people. That, when I was researching for this podcast, that's what came up about the Indian Express, that during the emergency period, it was the only paper openly... One of the few, but it particularly stuck out. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, for example, it wasn't just about arrests mindlessly of your opponents. It was also like, Forcible sterilizations, just taking away people's civil rights. Like forced vasectomies. Yes, yes. Right? Yes, what yes. was this whole forced vasectomy thing? Well, Sanjay Gandhi had a thing in his head that you can, you know, gain growth faster if you bring down the population control. But the question is, can you do it drastically without their consent, which is what was happening? I mean, it was a ridiculous situation where even every school teacher, they wanted their... Uh, grades, uh, sa uh, salaries to be given. They had to produce people who would agree to vasectomies. All government servants had to agree to that sort of a thing. And at the worst stages, policemen who had to sh give figures of the number of sterilizations that were being done just went forcibly into homes and rounded up people. Imagine living in an India like that where one day you wake up on a Saturday morning and you're looking for your weekend and then a cop walks in and says, come for a vasectomy with us. <laughs> I just want the villages that you waking up. The well, middle. maybe the Rounding rural version. Huh. The but rural basically rural. everyone was fighting with everyone to get figures to show that they, you know, especially those working in government. Mm. Intense, strange time. Yes, that one of challenging times. Do you look back at the 70s fondly? It's a learning experience. Okay. Now I can look back, but it was a quite harrowing then, as I said. What was the 70s like outside of politics? 70s was very politicized in Delhi wow. where I was living. The people were either on one side or another side. Sounds I'm sorry about to like say, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. And there's a lot of similarity between, I said, between Mrs. Gandhi and uh, Mr. Modi. You think things are repeating themselves? Well, in some degree, yes. I, I Certainly, the, the kind of polarization that I see today, that people have, don't see things in perspective. They see either you're on one side or you're other. I see it even in journalism. Mm. Okay. You know that there can be shades. Like take an example, recent opening of parliament. A person who's opposed to the government will be opposed to not just the opening of a new parliament. They're, at the same time, they will, uh, the, the people who are for the parliament, they will not see the fact that those wrestlers were being arrested just outside parliament. So, I mean, it's Everything is either you're on one side or the other. That's very unfortunate thing that has happened in India. As in you turn a blind eye to anything that's against your argument. Uh, uh, yes. Like even yes. a tiny fact. And, and especially dangerous for journalists. Especially, especially. Because the objectivity has long gone. The objectivity now, has long gone. As in they can't talk about things from us. I, I'm not saying that you have to say on the one hand and on the other hand. But you must use your judgment. You need to see things from a 360 degree perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think podcasters do just that. Good. Do you believe Maybe that? Maybe are the way of the future. I'm new to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I began YouTube in order to make YouTube videos become famous, earn money, etc. And mm. the outcome, the unexpected outcome was that because of the data I received through my YouTube channels, yeah. 
I have a bird's eye view of how people are thinking and what people are going to be interested in even six months down the line, just through data. Yeah. So I'm sure you've accumulated some data and some patterns in your head, which have taught you a lot about life. Yeah, because if you've observed for so many years, you have a sense of how people are going to react, what they're going to do. Okay. For, for take, for example, a journalist when covering elections. I think they have a better idea of the way people are likely to vote. Really? Mm. They're able to predict things accurately? Well, they obviously get it wrong very often. But mm. I mean, if they're a, a normal, intelligent journalist, if they ask enough people, they are in a position to, you know, <laughs> more so than a pollster, perhaps. Okay. Of course, pollsters have these huge staffs, etc. Mm. Uh, could you predict that election where Manmohan Singh became PM? 2004? Yes, I, 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 I don't want to... Uh, brag about it but I think I've almost every election where I've gone on the ground and had enough areas to cover I can make out the way the wind is okay mm. uh, when you go on the ground mm. why? But, uh, you have to have that time and effort to go into the interior and talk to people okay you know you can't make observations by talking to the experts it's by talking to the common people if you talk to enough of them that's exactly what our poll surveys do but our poll surveys are in using such huge amounts of manpower. But I think journalists have got attuned also to finding out what is happening in a country. Okay. Uh, for example, one vote from someone who's never ever left the village in their entire life counts just as much as the guy sitting in the Times Now studio, the Republic yes. studio, or NDTV yes. studio. Yes. Right? Yes. That's why you need to go out there and see that see, equal you have to go to the grassroots and ask enough people. Okay. How do you look back at that Manmohan Singh government, the whole tenure? Because as, was, as of now, it, you know, he, he did a lot of good things as, an, as a good, decent man. But there were too many scandals and there were scandals because he couldn't really act against his the allies in government and they were all making money. Okay, so it was a money... Well, I mean, some of his allies, the most famous example we know, of course, is the 2 G scam i mean they were literally handing it out to their favorites mm. and manmohan knew it but there was nothing he could do you know okay the government to, to survive he needed those allies with him okay the DMK uh, in this case i would love to have had a conversation with manmohan singh he said rather ill so i don't think you're going to get it because even people close to him he doesn't speak much yeah um how does he look back at his old tenure how do you think a very human empathetic side well, I suppose he does maybe feeling cheated that the economic growth was there in the early years of his uh, government, which he's not given credit for. His last years were, you know, bogged down by these various scandals which came up. And many of them, just to keep his government in power, he was perforce had to do it, you know, because his orders all like had to come from the first family of the Congress, you know. Mm. Okay. And again, money was the actual villain in this case. Money uh, was the reason. Not money. Each, each of those political parties supporting the Congress wanted their pound of flesh in terms of benefits. Cash. Well, it boils down to cash or whatever. Okay. So, uh, even though he had good aspects in his legacy. Oh, yes. Definitely. Uh, it's yeah, kind of overlooked. And, and uh, mind you, he was the, also the fi uh, finance minister when liberalization took place under Natsumara. Yeah, yeah. I think that's how my generation now knows him more. People hmm. don't even talk much about his... No, two, uh, he was two terms prime minister and it's unfortunate that in the many good things he did, it's overshadowed by the last few years mm. where people talked about corruption all the time. As, mm. Mm. Okay. How do you look at... Uh, but it wasn't his fault. He had to obey the orders. And, you no. know. Uh, what's your perception of Rahul Gandhi now? Well, I don't know. Uh, somebody made an interesting observation. I think it's the Chief Minister Hemanta Sharma of Assam. He said that he's, um, people say, oh, he did that march. Now he's becoming mature. But he says, is it at 55? A time when shouldn't you be mature by then? You're becoming mature. Mm. His present um, trip abroad, his statements sound a little off the mark. 
do you believe that a fair criticism is that he's not served in any cabinet no i don't think that matters i think i don't think he has his proper political instincts of what um people in this country want what is he clings to issues which are not that relevant if he feels that they personally affect him ah. rather than taking up the issues which will resonate with the people with the masses yes uh that is political instinct understanding how the masses think yeah and that you should know mr modi knows it very well hmm that's brilliant at it basically what pr and branding is also yeah in a sophisticated to play to the crowd no you have to know what is it that people want not what you want what okay. you think is the most important issue is not necessarily what people are most concerned people may be most concerned about prices something inflation and you may be most concerned about uh, playing down savarkar so mm. you know you should know what it is that the people the voters want mm. okay cool uh does this government have any worthy opposition going forward if all of them come together it will be a very worthy opposition there's And no question would you be brash enough to predict a possibility where all of them come together i can't say for sure because history has not shown that it's easy for them to get together and the reason has always been that the difficulty in selecting one leader one leader okay. and i think that the biggest mistake they will make if rahul gandhi is made that one leader it will be the greatest advantage for mr modi because the masses don't connect with no him. no because if you compare uh, mr modi with rahul i think the balance will definitely fill, be in favor of modi but if you leave it vague then all the people who are annoyed with some of the policies of the government or its performance they don't have a definite figure to compare then it would pro probably be helpful what do you think <laughs> uh i you know when i'm talking to people like you who've been political commentators for so long i don't feel worthy enough to express I my political not opinion political commentator in some ways tried. in some ways you're a political observer at least but uh me one last kind of question i have for you uh here is about the future of india because this whole conversation has been about uh, pattern recognition that's basically what happens over the course of any career so say you're yeah. a cricketer and you've played for 15 years mm. you are able to predict the game mm. as is the case with dhoni or as was the case with sachin tendulkar mm. etc i think it's the same with any industry if you spend a lot of time you are able to predict what's going to happen what is the future of our country according to you well there's i'm not going to stick my neck out and say it's this or that sure my apprehension is that it will become more and more authoritarian and less and less democratic democratic country. i mean democratic democracy will be that you go and put your vote in and that's it but democracy of proper democracy is a lot more than that it's the freedom you know to express yourself it's the pre freedom to interact with the people who are in power not they isolate themselves so that's one way we can go and the other is that one thing i have great faith in the people of india and when any government goes too far in one direction the, the voter never underestimate the voter they know what is happening in the country you said somewhere are they really aware but yes they do usually know okay so okay. i think if any government goes too far in the direction of authoritarianism they will have to face the electorate Do you think that this truly religious segregation in the government's mind that's the common criticism you hear at least in cities Yes yes i think it's a very wicked thing to do Do you think it's for the sake of political yes, agenda Yes yes it is it is uh, it's it's a vote catching device which is very wrong uh, You you mean if you to play to the baser instincts of people to on their religious you know to try and win their support on religious lines doesn't fire up people by saying that that religion is better or worse than you no i don't think religion should come into the place you should, uh, uh, a, a, a political a politician should try and win votes by offering things like 
Mr. Modi did in 2014. He said, I want development for this country. That was his theme. You know, this polarization along religious lines is when you have nothing else to offer. Mm. And you think that that's a very active ploy of our current government? Because I it asked all of been. them this. It has been quite okay. often, I, I, which when, is unfortunate. When I asked all of them this, they, yeah. I think Rajiv Chandrasekhar sir gave me the best answer. He said that he denied it. Yeah. He said that, no, that's not the case. Yeah. And overall, from the four conversations I had with them, all I got was conversations about development. But when you talk to a Muslim, a Christian, a lot of Sikhs, a lot of Buddhists in the country, there's a different kind of emotion in their heart. They do feel ostracized. And that's exactly what I told these cabinet ministers. And their rebuttal was that they are feeling these things because of false narratives from marketing on the other side. Which means that the opposition has probably marketed this idea that uh, they're using religion to well, it's divide pretty the country. obvious. <laughs> I mean, it stares us in the face that at the election time, you know, they tend to bring in a religious divide if it if they feel they need to whip up voter sentiment. Quite often they do it. Has it been happening recently? Yes. Okay. I'll tell you why I feel hesitant about having any opinion on this. Yeah. I feel hesitant because of the same reason that white men in America feel hesitant to talk about issues. Because as a Hindu, young entrepreneur, born into upper middle class India, I think I'm in a place of privilege to be having an opinion here. Right. And the honest opinion should come from the minorities. I generally sense a feeling of discomfort in their hearts about their own safety, about their own sense of being Indian, etc. Um, my gauge of the government using religion as a tool to divide and therefore create a vote, I mean, make votes a vote in there. Bank. Yeah. Huh. Uh, is when news reaches me in the same way that that whole CA, CAB thing reached me in such an intense manner where people are writing in and saying that, listen, you know, you need to talk about this, where I actually felt a need to talk about it as a content creator. I haven't felt that much of a need since that phase. And then obviously so much has happened since then. COVID happened since then, etc. Yeah, etc. Yeah. Et um, the gauge I got from talking to them this time was that they're very aggressive about making money for the country. Uh, I, I did sense that in all honesty. Uh, and again, this is not me being pro Modi or anything yeah. like that. I'm just relaying what I felt. Uh, because... I'm talking to them for like an hour each at least. So yeah. you do gauge where the other person's heart is at. There was a strong sense of doing the right thing in order to make money, in order to make us geopolitically stronger because of the geopolitical climate of our times. That we need to basically become richer as a country. And I think that that's their single pointed focus. And within the country, they're focusing on infrastructure. So I said that, you know, if you divide the country for votes, yeah. you're not doing this economic game a favor. Because if we truly want to grow as an economy, everyone needs to be happy and working together and united. And they all agreed. And their angle was we blame like the opposition. This is marketing from the opposition side. Now, as a political journalist, you don't agree? No. I mean, at some of the issues, I do. I'm not one of those who believes that minorities should have special rights. But uh, I at the same time feel that you deliberately, you know, raise certain issues to create a divide at election time. Okay. Hmm. Do you think something is going to come up soon? Just now in Maharashtra, there's been some trouble. And Mr. Pawar has made a statement saying that the BJP has a tendency to do this. Okay. And this starts building up as you go nearer to the elections? Huh. Okay, so we can expect. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily a pattern all the time, but unfortunately, it is being whipped up. And they do see themselves as sort of a Hindu Rashtra, you know, mm. the main mother organization, the RSS, does see that. Yes. Okay, okay. How much power does the RSS truly have in terms of how the nation is run? Uh, it has power, but I think with a strong prime minister like Modi, actually, he calls the shots eventually. Uh, the, I think at the present position is that Mr. Mo uh, uh, the, uh, it is the Modi who 
really okay. calls a shot, not the RSS. But of course, he will not like to alienate the RSS because the RSS means workers in the hundreds of thousands at election time who, you know, help the party in many ways. Mm. But when you have a really strong, as I said, whenever you have a very strong prime minister, then he counts for more. I, I, I think the RSS's view becomes secondary to him. Okay. Kumi Kapoor, that's the end of this podcast. I feel awkward calling you Kumi, but you've insisted that I call you Kumi. I, I feel awkward if you say ma'am. Okay. I feel like a schoolmistress. No, no. Like I, I feel very comfortable speaking yeah. with you. Uh, got to learn a lot today. Uh, I was waiting for a conversation like this in my own life because I do believe I need a lot of political education before heading into all these political chats that I've been doing on the show. So forget the podcast, forget these cameras, this mic, all that. Yes. I'm just grateful to you as a human being. Thank you for being so easy to speak with. This Thanks book of yours it. and all your other books will be linked down below. Uh, yeah. I can guarantee you people have fallen in love with you. The ones who stuck to this podcast uh, until this point. So once again, thank you for being on the show. Thank and you very much for giving some publicity to my book. No, it's 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 fantastic. All your books will be linked down below. And uh, I wish you all the love and joy thank and peace much. in the world. It's really kind of you. After thank you. Cool. Yeah. That was the episode for today. Who else would you like to see on the show? Please tell me. We often get accused on TRS of being right wing of only supporting the Modi government and not talking about the other side of stuff. That's not the truth, honestly. In my eyes, I'm a media professional. I have to be the platform for all of society to express itself. So I know that this podcast may not have sat well with many of our viewers, but it's important for me ethically as a media professional to do a podcast with someone whose views don't match the views of the majority of our nation. And I think that's what podcast culture should be bringing to India. So especially if you're a little upset at the end of this episode, I don't think I'm going to say sorry because I'm not sorry. I'm actually happy that we did this particular episode. And if you felt like we did the right thing, please give me other guest recommendations. I feel like all of India should be heard and all of India should be able to express itself in a well-researched, eloquent manner that was the episode with kumi kapoor when she returns the next time give me your recommendations what else would you have me ask her lots of love from trs we'll be back soon <laughs>